Are you ready to explore exciting careers in neuroscience and neurotechnologies? Then join me, your podcast host, Dr. Milena Krastenskaya, or simply Dr. K, and my amazing guests on the Neuro Careers Doing the Impossible podcast. Discover what it takes to turn the impossible into reality. Tune in now to a thrilling episode number 96. How can neurotechnologies help you take control of your brain and improve your mental health? This question lies at the heart of our current episode of Neurocareers Doing the Impossible. In this episode, we are joined by Juan Ricardo Diaz, the co-founder of PicPug Health and a neurofeedback expert with 22 years of experience. Juan has helped countless individuals to improve conditions like ADD, ADHD, ASD, sleep disorders, anxiety, and depression through the power of neurofeedback brain training. Not only has Juan been a neurofeedback practitioner, but for the last 10 years, he's also been a neurofeedback instructor, teaching others how to harness this transformative tool. As an author of 20 books on neurofeedback and mental health, Juan brings a wealth of knowledge, sharing the science behind neurofeedback and how it rewires the brain for better mental health. Join us as we dive into Juan's journey, his insights into neurofeedback, and how his methods are changing lives for the better. Whether you are curious about brain training or looking for ways to tackle mental health challenges, this episode is for you. Hello, Juan. It's a great pleasure to have you today on our podcast. Uh, can you please introduce yourself and also tell our listeners where you are joining us from, from what part of the world? Sure. Thank you so much, Milena, for the invitation. I really appreciate it. My name is Juan Diaz. I'm a marriage and family therapist and a neurofeedback practitioner for the last 22 years. I'm talking from the East Bay, California, very close to San Francisco. And um, well, I'm here to try to answer all those questions that you have for me. Thank you so much. Can you please tell our listeners a little bit about how did your career develop? How did you become a neurofeedback practitioner? What's your story? Oh, sure. It was by chance <laughs> because back, back then in the year 2001, I started working for a psychiatrist in Florida and he was working with a neurofeedback back then. Uh, he's one of the pioneers in South Florida doing neurofeedback. And he asked me to help him to do neurofeedback because he has a, like a big practice there. So he introduced me to the neurofeedback. I didn't understand anything about it. I said, what the heck is this? And he put some cables in the head and they went up and I don't just said. <laughs> so he invited me to join him. Um, he Even he paid for my training. Uh, which I did for several weeks. And then I started doing uh, sessions in uh, for the majority of his uh, patients. And I took with him like two years. Then I went by myself, uh, my own clinic and all that stuff. But since then, I fall in love with neurofeedback because it's a very powerful tool to help people. Thank you so much, Juan. Uh, and uh, now can you tell us what is neurofeedback for those who are maybe uh, not aware of what it is? Maybe you can explain it in simple terms. Sure, sure. Neurofeedback is a type of biofeedback, which means that if you give an external feedback to your body, your body will respond, okay? Let's say the regular biofeedback it, let's say measure your heart rhythm, maybe your blood pressure or 
the skin response, for example. And every time the those uh, variables get to the point that you want them to increase it or decrease it, the equipment, the device will give you a feedback. Normally it's a beep, like, like a sound. So your biology, in this case, your nervous system through the brain, understand that feedback and try to repeat it more and more. Like meaning like trying to follow up with invitation. It's like you're telling your nervous system to do more or less of something. So like minimize through breathing your heart rhythm. And so every time it gives you a feedback, so the uh, your nervous system follows and will decrease it. You know that normally, especially in Eastern civilization, they take many, many years to learn how to do that with the breathing techniques and the meditation and all of that. In the Western world, we're kind of lazy and do it through <laughs> equipment and devices. So, but at the end, it's almost the same outcome mm -hmm. uh, or the outcome. Uh, so with your feedback, the difference is instead of measuring uh, the heart rhythm or any other variable, you put in the middle an EEG, which stands for electroencephalogram, meaning measuring the brainwave activity at real time. When you put those sensors on your head, it could be like, let's say, one channel or two channels, uh, depends uh, how many sensors you have. The only thing they do, I mean, a regular EEG by your feedback, is measure that brain activity. That's it. That's the only thing they do. Some people think, oh, you're putting electricity in my brain. No, <laughs> it's the other way around. Your brain already is producing electricity in microvolts, so you're like tiny, but it's producing. And those sensors, the only thing they do is just measure the brain activity. So through a special software, you, you can like separate the brain waves, the different speeds, like slow, medium, and high speed. Uh, Delta, theta, alpha, low beta, beta, high beta. And you can do whatever you want or you need to that brain to do differently. Let's say the best way I put it is normally when you have an unbalanced brain, the brain doesn't work efficiently and you feel a uh, certain amount of, of symptoms, of negative symptoms. So with the neurofeedback, you're inviting the brain to get more harmonized, like in balance. And one of the best ways is to like to see the brain, how it is organizing itself from an electrical point of view. You have too much of low weight, too much of high weight or too low of the middle. So what's going on? And depends on that, you invite the brain to do more or less of the brain waves they need. So by repetition or reinforcement, eventually the brain learns how to do new activations, more positive one. So reducing, minimizing the symptoms or even getting better. So we can basically achieve certain brains state that we are looking for, that we want to have. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that is correct. If I may use an example, which is one of my area of specialty, uh, attention deficit disorder. Normally, the attention deficit disorder is related to brain activity in the prefrontal and frontal. Uh, it's the executive part of the brain, which normally you might find uh, an excess of low activity, meaning a range of the delta and theta in that part with the eyes open or doing an activity. So it's hard for the brain to engage in those particular characteristic like paying attention or concentrating or doing that stuff or remember a thing. So what we normally do is give medication to the person. So the most popular medications are uh, methamphetamines, which basically they're stimulant. And the thing is, once you swallow the pill, uh, there goes to the bloodstream to the brain and accelerate that part of the brain. So it minimizes the low activity and uh, speed up the brain, basically. So that's the reason you can pay more attention and concentrate better. But they have side effects, obviously, no? especially on children. Neurofeedback does similar, but in a very natural way, because you're not 
is not invasive. You're not putting anything inside your organism. It's just external, inviting the brain how to do it by itself and learning. Uh, the way the brain learns is creating new synapses, interconnections between neurons. And when you do neurofeedback, you're creating those uh, synapses, those pathways. So by repetition and reinforcement, every time you do a session, your brain is learning how to concentrate better, how to pay more attention. So in this example, we train the prefrontal and the frontal to do that specific function. Thank you so much. That's a great explanation. And my next question is, you mentioned that you fell in love with neurofeedback and that's how you uh, started doing it more and more and you're still doing it and you still love it. So what made you to really like uh, neurofeedback? What was that main thing that attracted you to it? Oh, many, many things. Back then, because uh, the first experience were so amazing. Uh, let me put it like this. The first time that I worked with neurofeedback uh, with uh, this psychiatrist, this doctor in Florida, I used to be seeing around 40 cases per week, a lot of cases. And so I was like back to back Monday through Saturdays. All of them were within the spectrum uh, with autism uh, because he has a huge population of children with autism. Even 10 of them were with mutism. They didn't talk. So I was curious to see how can we help them using this new technology? So little by little, I was learning in the process of learning and I saw all the beautiful uh, outcomes coming from the therapy, uh, which you can play placebo with a little guy with autism, <laughs> okay? So you know if something is coming out different and in a good sense and the parents reporting, they improve their sleep, they're getting better at school, they're more patient, less uh, impulsive. You say, wow, this really works. It's, uh, I thought it was like magic. But after that, because I'm kind of a curious guy, I started saying, okay, I started talking to this doctor, to the psychiatrist and other psychiatrists, which I, I really love them, uh, good friends that I have. And I start asking questions, which I didn't know because it's not where my area of specialty say, okay, if the brain controls everything, where are exactly those parts and sites that control this Peach, for example, and they start telling me, uh, they teach me with a book and, um, you know, the slides and thing, explaining how everything works. I say, huh. <laughs> so I start creating protocols for these kids. And to make a long story short, out of the 10 kids with autism that they didn't talk, they have mutism, eight of them start talking after six months uh, doing the the speech protocol that I created. And the two of them who didn't uh, talk then uh, afterward, like a year later, we got the information from the parents. Uh, they did like, a, I don't remember what was an MRI or a CAT scan, showing that they have a real uh, deficiency in the broadcast area. So they couldn't speak no matter how much you trained them. Nope. I say, oh, that explains a lot. So since then, I learned that you can do some kind of magic and miracle on them. You can help that kind of population that they're, they don't have those kind of help. If you have a, a kid with autism, you will understand much better what I'm saying because it, you don't have too many options in the market. Normally, the, when you go to a doctor, even with the best intention, they just give you medicines, medication for that. And the medication doesn't resolve anything. The neurofeedback is like a new window, a new hope for that population. And including also ADD and ADHD, which, by the way, uh, attention deficit disorder uh, shares a common symptoms with uh, the population with the spectrum. Because normally kids with the spectrum, they can have easily many, many symptoms like lack of attention or concentration. And the ADDSA also might have some of the symptoms that uh, ASCQ shows. 
So it's normal to use the kind of the same approach for both and you will get the benefits. So I, I would say that this new technique will cure the SD. No, it's not true, but it helps a lot with the majority of the symptoms. There are studies that show, I believe Dr. Robert uh, Coven, uh, he was in New York, I believe now he's in Texas, I don't know, he moved, that he showed the efficiency of doing neurofeedback uh, with this population and the, all the, sim the main symptoms like sleep, study, and like when they're sleeping or echolalia, all that, they improve in at least 40%, which is a lot if you think about it. So it's normally, and then I did some research and, and, and published some papers on my side through the years, and now I'm here. I've, <laughs> still in love with the technique and trying to help as many people as I can. Thank you so much. Uh, what did it take for you to become a solo practitioner? Because at the beginning you were helping a psychiatrist here in Florida. What did it take for you to become a practitioner that is already doing everything on your own? How did you choose the equipment? Uh, did you need to have certain certifications? How did you start your own practice? So can you share that? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, remember back then, the neurofeedback was not uh, like well-known, even less than today. That is not as well-known as I wish. But there's like no board or body in the state that controls who who's doing neurofeedback or not. But even though, because uh, when you are a mental health professional, you need license to work. But for neurofeedback, they, they don't ask for too much things. Now, I understand that in Florida, it's controlled by the board. I'm not sure which one it is, but uh, I understand that it's controlled or monitor at least. But back then, I just got my certification from the different uh, training courses that I took. And besides, I, I had the two years of experience with a heavy caseload. Um, so I started little by little with some uh, new patients or clients in this case. And then I took it from there. And, and because I want to believe I was very good doing what I did back then, I started having a lot of uh, referrals, like word of mouth. So I then in Florida, like 14 years. <laughs> yeah, doing their fit. But then I move on. Well, <laughs> yes. Okay. So good to know that you were right here. Um, uh, yes. Thank you. Um, how did you choose your device? Do devices differ? Uh, what should one look for when one wants to start their own neurofeedback practice? To be quite honest, in the beginning, I chose it for the price <laughs> because I couldn't buy the one that the doctor has because it was really expensive back then, those systems. So I went and do my research looking for uh, very good devices, but affordable. So that was the reason I got to these uh, devices uh, uh, from Australian company. Uh, which are marvelous equipment uh, and devices, uh, even like kind of uh, portable because they work with infrared and uh, very beautiful uh, design uh, software. So I, I started using those, but then little by little, I start like going to different, uh, you know, those events, uh, uh, national uh, about your feedback. So I started knowing new companies and new uh, different approaches. And as I mentioned before, I'm a very curious guy. I start uh, like buying those different equipments uh, and software and trying and just comparing the effectiveness of each one of them. No? Nowadays, it's kind of hard because uh, most of them that are really good is not the device or or the software is more about the clinician, how much you know and the skills that you have and, and the knowledge, uh, because the majority of the devices are really good. The, the ones that are in the market right now, the, all of them, they do exactly, like very similar. They read, they amplify, they show the, the things. Obviously, I have my preferences, but it's the one that I like. It's, that doesn't mean that it's better, it's just different. But yes, I have a couple of devices in the market that that I really 
like I normally recommend to my colleagues. Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, so again, if somebody wants to start their own practice, what is required for that now? Because as you said, many years passed after you started. Um, obviously, there are some probably new requirements, some new things uh, for the neurofeedback practitioner. So how does it work now for those who want to start this practice? Believe it or not, that's a good question, but it's a tricky one. Because back in the days, and I'm talking back in the year 2000, 2001, We've been called back then the weekend warriors <laughs> because the training course was like five or six days in a row and that's it. So eight to nine hours daily, it was super intense. So you submerge into the knowledge of neurofeedback and you do a lot of sessions through those days. And, uh, well, your head explodes basically with too much information. But at the end, when you came out of, from those training, you were really tired and confused. So to start doing like from zero, from scratch, after a training like that, it was almost impossible. So I learned that that's not the best way to go. And I tried back then uh, to reach some universities and college to make it like a career, but once, no, no luck on that. So what I normally uh, suggest to people that want to start is say, okay, you can do, you can choose whatever training course there is in the market. I can send you to several there are, which I consider are the best. Uh, those are still like five, six days, a little bit expensive, but okay, you can do it and try their devices. But then you need like a constant monitoring. And that's the reason, and, and I'm seeing plenty of colleagues that are, are doing the, the training directly with me. I offer to them the chance to train directly one-on-one -on -one in a training course for 10 weeks. So it's a one, one hour or one and a half hour per week after they doing the training, so we can go like little by little, explaining, answering all the questions. It's more like a mentoring thing. So at the end of that, you should be able to start your own practice. But do the, uh, like normally the people did in the past, they, you do the, the training course in 6A and then start doing, uh, seeing clients. So no, that's not a good idea. So you already mentioned one thing that is not a good idea just after this short course to start doing your own practice. What are other things that people who want to start their neurofeedback practice, what they shouldn't do? Maybe three main things that they shouldn't do. That is a mistake. Well, there are plenty of them. The first one is not understanding that normally each people that are offering services, uh, those training course, normally they're the owners of the devices and the software. So they're pushing their brand and their approach. They're, uh, there's quite different uh, ways to skin a cat. There's a saying, no? So there's quite a different uh, things to approach how to do neurofeedback. So if you do one training course, that doesn't mean that that's everything you will learn. Just the first step is understanding, like open your mind. You're just seeing one style or approach to do neurofeedback, but you need a little bit more. So you're expecting to do several training courses to just compare and like minimize the expectation that you're going to start training right away. It's not a good idea. In the sense that you need uh, mentoring, you need to practice. Normally, I recommend do it to yourself first so you feel the sensations, the outcome of the sessions. Obviously, monitor by an expert, not a skilled practitioner. And then use your own family, uh, your spouse, your children, your cousins, whatever. And then you can use some friends. And uh, after that, when you're doing maybe 
10, 20, 50, 25 sessions with each one of them and including yourself, you can start thinking of doing uh, like a regular uh, person, like a client or uh, a patient. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, how long does it take to really get to the level when you can offer really high quality services to people? How much training, how much of that practice that you just mentioned um, is needed to reach that level? It depends a lot on the person, how fast they can learn and how they can follow through. But the minimum, I would say three months. But normally it takes like between four to six months to get into there. Then after the six months, they can start seeing uh, new clients. But to get like to the peak, they need at least a year or a couple of years to get really good at it. Right now, we're in a position that is very interesting, to call it somehow, because of the technology. Uh, the tendency of this kind of technology is that it's going to move to the wearable and portable part of devices. So the clinical setting that I'm used to doing, I'm still doing it here in California, is going to be just reserved for like severe cases. The rest, the common people, I believe they're going to use uh, portable devices. They're already using it by now, but it's not a great percentage. But I think the tendency is that that's where the whole system is moving to. So based on that, we have to take that into consideration. Plus the AI era that, that is, uh, it, it's not, well, it was born a few years ago, but now it's at the peak. So I know it will affect a lot the training because you can uh, put AI in a lot of different parts. So with new technologies, but let me put it like this, Milena. When I start back then in the year 2001, it took you many, many, many hours to learn theory, to practice, to do things, uh, blah, blah, blah. So it was very heavy information. Nowadays, with their system, which one of the I recommend the most, is the other way around. You don't have to learn that much in the beginning because the system practically do everything for you. And so everything is set, like the algorithm is set for you to do a brain map with like a recipe, just following the steps, just follow the guides. You can do, then it, it give you the uh, the training plan. You just follow through with the training plan and, and teach you how to do a session, which is basic. Uh, a session is not complicated to do it which is complicated to understand what's going on and how to help people. But everything is that. So the idea with this different approach and new approach using new technology is that it's a hands-on practitioner experience. So you're learning in the process. While you're doing, you're learning. So the, the learning curve is like exponential. So you learn a lot in just uh, much less time. But let me put it like that. But besides that, uh, let's go back to the AI comment. Imagine using AI uh, nowadays with this. I mean, the AI can figure it out how that specific brain is behaving um, based on a specific uh, algorithm. You can train to, like, okay, learn about this brain and recommend certain protocols to enhance the activity and then change this and change that. And the user uh, interface is going to be super easy to use. So th there is a lot of it going to happen in the next few years. Yes, thank you. And you mentioned that the practitioners who are just starting, that they make a lot of mistakes. So you already mentioned uh, some of them. Um, one that you mentioned is believing that uh, there is only one style, but there are many styles approaches. Also that the people who are teaching, they're usually uh, really behind their own devices and uh, they have their own agenda. So it's important to remember about that as well. And as I understood also that it 
takes time and practice uh, to get to that level that you want to get. And it's important to keep that in mind. Is there anything else that you notice in this uh, novice, um, just beginners mistakes that they're making? Well, uh, the more you can find information, read a lot of books, there's a lot of books nowadays. Yeah, well, including mine, I've written two books, but in Spanish. Sorry about that. No, not in English <laughs> yet. <laughs> uh, but there's a plenty. I, I remember uh, getting started with your feedback. Dr. John Damos wrote a beautiful book, uh, how to learn uh, about uh, neurofeedback is uh, one very good way to start learning in, in depth because he has a lot of information there in that book. Uh, but there is plenty of them. That are, I have read at least 15 to 20 different books about neurofeedback and you get uh, some ideas from there. But besides that, always find a good mentor that can guide you through the process, especially in the beginning. That's very big. The other thing is that don't get scared because the, the brain is so awesome and beautiful that you can make mistakes. That's no problem. You can fix them. Because the problem, if you're making a mistake and you don't know that you're making a mistake and you keep on doing it, you might create some uh, like negative outcome, to call it some way. But it's really hard to make mistakes uh, with neurofeedback. Uh, you have to be really stubborn. <laughs> so because normally just pay attention to the person you're training, uh, how they act. My baseline is after or while you're doing a training session with me and after you should feel the same or better, never worse. If you feel worse, okay, that's on me. I did something which is not right for your brain. So I need to figure out what is that and change it until you feel the same or better. Yes, it makes sense. You mentioned the importance of choosing the right mentor. How would you recommend to choose the right mentor? What would be your approach? You have to know a little bit more about neurofeedback. Uh, in fact, there are some books that uh, talk about which one are like the leaders of the field. So if you can find those information, there is a really plenty. I have a lot of friends and colleagues that are like the pioneers of neurofeedback and they're really good mentors. Uh, the thing is that they have the time and also I don't know how much they charge for that, but I know that they can be mentoring. Uh, but there's a lot of people doing that, including myself. I mentor a, a, a quite a few professionals doing that. Mm -hmm. Can you tell a little bit more about your mentoring, how people can find you? How do you do your mentoring? You already mentioned a little bit, yes, how you offer 10 weeks, as I understand, but maybe you can go into more details for those people who are listening and maybe want, uh, want to work with you. Sure. Well, but I need to mention it's very limited, my space, because I, I, I'm kind of busy, but I have some few spots just to let the people know no normally i start meeting with the people on a regular basis uh, we define the date and the time and we meet between 60 to 90 uh, minutes no uh, normally i mentor people that they already know how to do neurofeedback i don't mentor people that are just getting started <laughs> I'm sorry about that i apply the technique i, I call it the karate kid technique you, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> yes. Mr. Miyagi, like Trevor. Okay, I go back to the basic with the people and make sure that they really know, understand what they are doing and how to increase and improve the techniques and get much better outcome. That's it. And I also, because of my experience, I do certain recommendations, uh, even in marketing, uh, how to uh, get outside and get more people. Uh, so it's not only the clinical part, it's the whole business of, of neurofeedback, no? So basically the, my study is the 10 weeks, but the mentor part, I offer different like uh, packages, no? Uh, for example, right now I have a several, uh, like four companies. They, they are in six month basis, the other one are 12 months. So they do the whole year and we meet twice a month, 
uh, with them, like in 90 minutes each time. So we talk about a specific, we discuss cases that, you know, sometimes, and you will find very severe cases that you don't know how to approach and handle them. Uh, normally do certain like advices and recommendations on that. Um, that's uh, the, the normally the way I work. But going back, the uh, people that have maybe uh, a few experience, like not that much, or maybe a couple of months doing their feedback, I offer the 10 weeks program because it's the easy one to how to learn, it, especially in the beginning. So that's basically what I offer. And they can, oh, by the way, they can find me um, in the trainingfl.com, which is a website of my company. You can write directly to me, which is Juan at trainingfl.com. Yeah, thank you so much for mentioning that. And we will add all this information into our podcast notes for our listeners. Yes, thank you. And uh, you also mentioned today that there are different styles and approaches that different mentors have. Uh, can you maybe uh, provide an examples of several different approaches uh, for our listeners to know what exists out there and uh, what they can choose from? Yes, there are plenty of them. The most popular one is the one that I do, which is, uh, it calls regular EEG training. Uh, it's like the regular neurofeedback, meaning that you put the sensors and you do the EEG based on the, the different brain waves, the delta, theta, alpha, and you train up or down or coherence or uh, synchrony sessions, and you can do alpha, theta, all that stuff. Okay, that's one style. No, it's the most popular one. There's other uh, approach, which is based on the Othmer, which are uh, a couple that are very famous in the neurofeedback world. They offer uh, ILF, which stands for infralow frequency training. It's a different one. It's the same approach in the sense that you use sensors, but you now you're not only measuring those brain waves that everybody knows, like the delta, alpha, and beta. They go really down deep in the brain uh, with the microvolts and uh, micro, uh, microhertz. Uh, so it's a, a different approach uh, to the training. It is, uh, you have to learn directly with them, the, who are like the inventors of that. I will say that is different. It, it, it could be, if you think about it, a little bit easier in the sense of, uh, of the use um, and the outcomes too, somehow. But it's definitely different from the regular EEG. They start with regular EEG and then uh, they move to ILF. Then there's another way uh, to do it, which is LENS, uh, the low emission uh, neurofeedback uh, system, which is basically the electrodes that you use, they create microvolts, uh, they create electricity. So, but it's a microvolt, you don't feel it. It's like a tiny. Zzz, zzz, so it's the working from the outside in. Uh, so when you put you place the, the sensor on your scalp, you will invite the brain to do certain brain waves based on the electricity that the electrode put. So it's an active electrode instead of being a passive electrode. But the principle is exactly the same. Uh, it really works. I mean, it, it really doesn't matter how. Now, those are like the main three approaches that exist. But that doesn't mean that everybody does the same thing <laughs> because it's uh, like line of learning or school uh, depends from whom you learn your process, you will approach the neurofeedback differently. And let's say I remember back in the days, they used to be a Canadian, Val Brown. He created the uh, when back in the days uh, the system I, I believe called Senker, but now is Neuro Optimal. The way they create and uh, which I like their approach, I don't use it, but I like it, is a kind of a simple one. They use only the sensory motor part of the brain, which is where the frontal lobe meets the parietal. They train that part, the strip and C3, C4, which are the position, and they go very uh, in detail what to train down and what to train up of those parts depends on what the brain is doing. 
So if you think about it, well, it sounds simple. It's a little bit more complex, but the way to do it is kind of simple and the outcomes are really good. So uh, I really understand what they're trying to do. The thing is that they only do that kind of setting. If you come to me, I will move the sensors all over the place. Depends where your brain needs it. I can do frontal training, parietal training. I can do occipital, uh, temporal. Depends on what you need. But it's just a different approach. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, actually, I wasn't aware of those different approaches, although I love uh, neurofeedback. I've heard about it and I was learning, but um, it's good to know that there are all, all these um, different uh, ways of doing it. And uh, I, I suppose this also can be um, chosen for different type of changes in the brain, yes, and for maybe different diagnosis, one uh, way would be more advantageous than another one. In terms of that, maybe you can uh, provide us a big picture of where um, neurofeedback can be used for what type of changes in the brain. You already mentioned uh, autism spectrum, ADHD, ADD. What other maybe disorders or changes in the brain and also maybe not only uh, certain disorders but helping people to increase or, or to improve their potential or their behavior in a certain way uh, like uh, maybe helping people to achieve uh, results in uh, sports or other venues Yes, I really appreciate that you mentioned that because um, I you just remind me that I work on peak performance for several years in Florida, uh, just before I moved uh, from uh, out of Florida. I saw NBA players, PGAs, and what else? The shooting, or oh, also ice skaters. Uh, I saw a, a bunch of uh, professionals, athletes, and it really helped. But that's a way different story. You, you use, obviously, regular uh, EG biofeedback for them because they're humans. They suffer from anxiety, some from sleep, so you can help them in a lot of things. But you can do also like a, a prime peak performance package for them, which basically teach the brain how to create the, you know, the zone state that they need for their performance and how to achieve faster, easier, and stay longer. So through different, uh, like synchronies and alpha theta training, there's a lot of things that you can do with athletes. But trying to answer the, the first question, remember that the brain basically controls everything in your body. So the big answer is you can do almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> for any almost any symptom, I don't know if you, if your podcast let me. Can I share a, a a screen with you or? Yeah, absolutely, you can. Can you see the screen now? Uh, yes, I can see the screen. I, I will read it for you. This is a, mo a most common clinical applications for neurofeedback. Obviously, in the top one, because of my experience, that doesn't mean that it only helps on that. Is attention deficit disorder and attention deficit with and hyperactivity disorder, the spectrum of autism, but you can also help people that suffer from any type of anxiety disorder, a sleep disorder. It's amazing how you can help people. And by the way, more than 40% of the population here in the state suffers from a sleep disorder. So that's a good uh, thing that you can offer. You can help people with depression, seizures. I will say that is one of the main ones because if you remember the story of, neuro, of neurofeedback back in the 1960s, they started uh, doing neurofeedback for seizures. So that's uh, like the beginning of neurofeedback was that. So because it basically stabilizes the brain. A brain that causes seizures is because it's unstable. When you train the brain, it will get more stable, so the seizures minimize or even disappear. 
It can help children or even adults with learning disabilities. Uh, is It works awesome for headaches and migraines. And as we mentioned before, the peak performance for athletes. And not only athletes, it can also help, uh, let's say, people in the business, the, you know, the high rank uh, and business people that they suffer like a lot of anxiety for a lot of meeting and uh, the deals they have to go through uh, and family and see so you can uh, help them with, for the peak performance in their area too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Juan, the next question I have about uh, already people who are learning to do uh, this uh, neurofeedback uh, customers, yes, your uh, basically patients who, who come to work with you. Do you see the difference between how different people learn, meaning that maybe some people learn slower, some people learn faster. And if so, what are the factors that influence how fast do we learn uh, neurofeedback? Well, what do you mean? They don't need to learn anything about neurofeedback. You just give a overall explanation how it works. So because they're maybe they're curious what you're doing. But besides that, they don't need like the detailed information. But if you're referring to the learning process inside the brain, mm -hmm. how yes. the brains learn. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's different. It, it, it is because remember, even though all of us, we have a brain is just like the fingerprint. It's very similar, but none is identical. We have 8 billion people on the planet. There are 8 billion different fingerprints. No one has identical one. So the brain is kind of the same. It's different. So you need to adapt the training to that person. I won't say that they respond better or worse. They respond just differently. And the speed is random because you don't know... Uh, the, that's kind of a Pandora box because you don't know what's going on inside the brain at that moment. But then little by little, when you know how the the client or the patient respond to each training, you get to know better the brain and help them in a better way. And eventually, uh, uh, like at the middle and at the end, they will get level up. Like meaning that at the end, they will get benefit from it. Uh, there's not too much different at the end. Is some uh, what I'm trying to say is some brain will respond really fast to the training and get uh, uh, like much better, very uh, obviously and faster, and some others get uh, like slowly, you know, that that's fine. But at the end, maybe 40 sessions after, if you compare both of them, most likely they have kind of the same outcomes. Me, or you, here we we'll go again. If you use like a subjective scale from zero to 10, 10 being the best, they maybe start in four and they end up in an eight, which is amazing because it's almost double. They feel way, way better. So both of them, I will say that they should be very close to each other. But how the process went, well, that depends on the brain. Okay. Do you see any cases where a brain didn't learn or learn not as significant as uh, people might be wanted? Yes, in, in my experience, uh, it's 85 to 90% of success, meaning almost nine out of 10, they respond well, but there's always a case that's no response at all. Why? I don't know. The I will call it the stubborn brain. <laughs> they don't follow instructions, and that's fine. But I, I don't understand why. But they don't respond, and that's fine because even though the best medication in the world, it doesn't fit everyone. So it, it's kind of of the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next question is: Did you notice that the learning of the brain improves with time. Uh, for example, if you are applying one protocol and 
the brain learned how to modulate certain activity. Uh, then when you are helping the same person already to modulate a different type of activity, this happens already faster or not. Well, I I'm not quite sure why you're interested in the speed of the process because sometimes it takes time, sometimes it's faster, but you, and from my point of view, it really doesn't matter because the most important is the final outcome that the person improves and feel better. What I will say is a brain that is already being trained, let's say for X amount of sessions, I will consider minimum 40 sessions to say that that specific brain is already trained. But if you get that same brain already trained, let's say six months after, one year after, once you start training that brain, it's easier and faster to do any changes because the brain already knows how to do. It's like, oh, I mean, this, <laughs> being here done that before. So it's that the brain knows. So it's much more, uh, better and faster. And I normally recommend to all people say, if you like the outcomes, uh, just give uh, like a keep like a maintenance through the years because life happens, no uh, things happen, traumas, a thing, and you have to go back and do a couple of sessions, like 10, 15, 20 sessions, and then repeat it. It's just like going to the gym, and, uh, and that's that's my general recommendation on that. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And uh, my question wasn't uh, really about speed, although it, it, as an outcome, speed, uh, speed, of course, was involved, but uh, exactly this um, brain's ability to change, uh, this ability to change based on what the brain already learned. Yes, so how how does this affect the future learning? So basically, it, it becomes more plastic and more amenable to change. Yes, yes, definitely. And that's a key component, Milena. The beauty of the brain is the brain plasticity. They is capable to change and adapt and do it better and better through time. So if you train the best way possible, that brain, the brain will, I mean, I, I will say the the sky is the limit. The more you push, the more you get from the brain. You, you see that, I mean, push in the good sense, like train in a good way. And then if you want, let, let's say in the beginning, okay, I'm here because I have a sleep problem. Okay. We train the, the different areas of the sleep, the sleep improves. Let's say, but you know what? I read a lot and I want to increase my uh, learning process or reading uh, speed or whatever. Well, we can train that part of the brain and ask the brain to see how it gets to improve that part and we can train it out. So the more you invite the brain to do something different, most likely the brain will learn more because of the brain plasticity. Mm -hmm. Yes. And in, in that regard, I have another question. For example, I know that when people are working with stroke rehabilitation, um, at least the device that I worked with um, uh, for uh, rehabilitating upper extremities, and we're working with this rehabilitation, it's brain-computer interface, but very similar approach. And we noticed that not only upper extremity, functions better, but because we're increasing brain plasticity, uh, lower extremities are also starting to work better. They're also improving function. So do you see any of changes like that in your participants, in your patients? Yes, yes. It's funny that you mentioned that, Milena, because right now I'm seeing one very severe case of a stroke. Uh, this guy, this is a 40 years old male, uh, African-American. We have a severe stroke all over the brain, basically. Uh, I saw that CAT scan is, whoa, it's just like a black spot all over the place. He's in wheelchair. Like in the beginning, I started working with him uh, last year. No mobility, no speech, no like zero, like. Uh, well, most of the MDs that used to see him last year, they say that he won't improve, that he's basically almost like a bestial or something like that. And I invite the, I talk to the parents and say, hey, let's give her a try. And 
you, you never know. Well, I know because I, I saw previous cases similar and I know they can improve a lot. You only have to be really patient because if you can solve, uh, I mean, quote unquote, solve a sleeping issue or, or migraine or even headaches problem uh, in 10, 20 uh, or 15 sessions, that's fine. And most likely you're, you're going to be able to achieve that. But for these cases, you have to end for a year, two years, and sometimes even three years of training because it's a very complex situation. That doesn't mean that you need to wait that time to see changes. Because let me put it like this. This person, this male, he has six months of training. He already started moving both legs, both arms. It starts to swallow him much better because he has a stuck with that. Now he start uh, uh, talking. I can't say the word that he says because he's vulgar, but <laughs> he says one word now. Uh, and the mother, is, she was just laughing about that. Um, so he started doing a lot of things. Yeah, he's in really better mood. He sleeps better. Uh, he even when I ask him, he comes uh, to my clinic, say, how do you feel today? He's been like thumbs up. Uh, that's amazing, you see. Uh, and normally because they get the rigidity of the muscles when they get the stroke. Right now, both of his hands are more, much more flexible and relaxed. Almost, he, he also has in the one of his foot, like pointing to the inside of the part. Now it's just, both are very stable. So there's a lot of progress in just six months. But obviously our aim is to make him walk again, talk again completely. So I, I'm expecting a lot of things. Maybe I'm pushing too much to myself. I, I mean, but that's what, what I expect with a train. But it's just doing the right thing at the right moment and just have that uh, perseverance through time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what was the most challenging case in all your practice? Well, I, I can say this is one of the most challenges that I have. Yeah, a stroke is very, uh, yeah, it's because of the time. You, you get frustrated. It's so nice and easy to train all the things that you see the outcome right away, just in a couple of weeks. Okay, I'm done. We're ready. <laughs> For example, I saw a kid, he, he's uh, around 20 years old. Uh, he has been suffering from stuttering and he has to read. And I helped him like in four weeks, done. Yeah, and he was suffering that for like 14 years. That, that was amazing. Yeah, so it, it, that gave me a lot of, uh, I feel so good about that. I, I've been uh, able to help him. It was fascinating, but it was fast. That I like uh, the best <laughs> because it's really fast. But sometimes we need to be really patient see, okay, these are harder cases. And I love challenges. Uh, the, the more complicated the thing is, the more I get into it and say, okay, I need to solve this uh, somehow. Uh, so, uh, yes, I will say that those cases are the most severe one, the stroke one. Mm -hmm. And how do you separate the cases that you just need patience, you need perseverance, and uh, you know that you will see the result from those cases uh, that you mentioned there are 15, 25% that their brain doesn't learn. Yes, so that there will not be effect uh, that you're hoping for. How to separate those, those things? I believe that I don't separate them, to be honest, in the sense that because I don't know if the brain is going to respond or not. I just do exactly the same protocol. I do a brain map in the beginning or a QEG, depends what I have available. And then I take it from there and do I start doing the sessions. What I do differently is that when I get to, I reach to the session number 10, maybe 12, and as a person at that moment, still nothing happened. I will start, hmm, something's where I, and I might start doing uh, like different, maybe a little bit more aggressive approach to see if the person responds. If it doesn't respond, I just talk to them and meet with them and say, you know what? It seems that this training is not fit for your brain because it's not responded the way it should. So, and, and I ask them, do you want to continue to see if it, because some brain, 
they need more training to start responding. I see changes after 25 sessions in a certain brain, but it took me 25 sessions, which is a lot, to start seeing uh, minimal changes there. But they have the patient and also well, the financial part to get into that kind of training. But you know, I'd be as open and honest and I can say, okay, normally you should start seeing some progress between five to 10 sessions. If you don't see anything in 10 sessions, mm, there is something wrong there. And after how many sessions, if a person doesn't respond, you know that that's it. You know, the brain is not responding. Like you said, you know, 10, 25 or 40 sessions when you already know for sure they need to try something different. It's impossible to get there. I will aim to 25. If there is 25 sessions on and nothing happens, I won't spend more time or money doing this. Understand. And what was the most challenging part in your uh, development of your practice, of your neurofeedback practice? And how did you solve that challenge? <laughs> That's another tricky question. Uh, and I'm laughing because you know how much I suffered back in the days learning this? It was understanding what I was doing. Understanding how neurofeedback works is really complicated. Because now that I know how to explain it, like, quote unquote, easier, that doesn't mean that it's easy. Because it's not only the technique and the technology, it's also the brain, know about the brain and how the brain responds, and how do you know where and what and when. So there's too many variables going on at the same time. So it's really complex. So uh, I was like in shock for like two years, believe me. Uh, in the first two years, I went, what the heck I'm doing? and uh, Why the person is getting better? Uh, I saw the oscilloscope moving up and down and say, okay, what is Thing means uh, I, don't, I didn't understand a lot, but I just keep on going because saying, okay, this is working, but I, I didn't know how. No, uh, that doesn't mean that I understand everything right now because even the best, uh, uh, Georgi uh, Brzezinski, I believe, is one of the best neurologists in the world. Uh, and he says that if, if a person tells you that he really knows the brain, that person is a liar <laughs> because the brain is so complex and complicated that it's really hard to really know the brain. But as far as I know now about the brain and about the training, it's a, yes, it's the most challenging part is really understanding what you're doing. So how did you solve this? Uh, you mentioned that you just persevered. Um, is this um, uh, enough or you need to do something more in, in order to overcome this challenge? Yeah, you have to get out of your comfort zone and push yourself to study hard. Read a lot of books, go to a lot of different presentations, talk to people that they really know what they're doing, uh, have the experience. So, yes, you, you, there's a lot of homework to do. Mm -hmm. Are there any venues, um, any uh, conferences, workshops that you would recommend for a practitioners to visit, to uh, get through that bump and start to get comfortable with uh, uh, doing um, your feedback? But there's plenty of them. Each state has their own boards of biofeedback and neurofeedback. You can Google all of them, but all, all of the states, I normally go to ISNR and AAPB, who are the most popular ones. Uh, they have annual conference around the states. You just have to Google when is the next one this year. I, I believe one is coming in September. So th there is a nice way to listen and hear from the experts in the field. It's a really nice opportunity. Also, there is the BFE in Europe, which I've been invited uh, long, uh, back in 2015 um, uh, to expose one of the cases of uh, uh, autism and ADHD using your feedback. If you're in Europe, you can look for the BFE. And they have also annual conference all around Europe. 
they change uh, countries, but they normally do a really good events there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what was the most surprising thing for you over all these years you've been doing neurofeedback? I believe it was those kids that they, they started talking. It, it, that was impressive because I feel the joy, even uh, the moms crying when they started talking, they were so, uh, the, the, I mean, I can't express my gratitude and um, feeling for them, for the technique and for everything, because that's a game-changing story that a kid with 10 years old, not able to talk, and six months, eight months later, they start talking using full sentences. That was amazing. Thank you. Uh, my next question is about the changes that are happening and already happened in the neurofeedback domain. Uh, you mentioned AI, uh, that the things are changing because of that. Uh, if you compare the current time with the one uh, when you were just starting, what are the main changes, maybe applications, or maybe the way we perform neurofeedback? So anything that you see is different um, now compared to previous times. Well, I believe that if you ask Elon Musk about the difference of the rocket uh, that went to the moon in 1969 and his rockets now, he said, yeah, they're rockets, but they why different. <laughs> well, it's something similar to that. Because uh, I'm laughing because I remember the computers that I used to use back then. It was based on DOS. <laughs> no, no, I don't, didn't have even a mouse. The mouse didn't exist. Uh, uh, back then, so I used you know, the blue screen thing. Uh, it, it was horrible to make that computer work with the neurofeedback system. Uh, and it's quite a, a different story and approach. Uh, I, I used to remember uh, it was very rigid because you can't change a lot of things. It is what you see is what you get. But nowadays, everything is flexible, comfortable, affordable. Uh, you see, back, back then, I remember if you want to start doing your feedback, you need like $25,000 or something like that, which back then in the 2000s, that was a lot of money. Uh, but nowadays, no, you can do a clinical practice with less than 5000 So it changed a lot. Yes, that's a great uh, thing you mentioned. Uh, for those who want to start, uh, what would be your recommendation? Where can they start? What should they do? They want to have their own neurofeedback practice. So what's next? I would like to talk to them first. <laughs> and that's the way I normally work because it depends. Because I need to ask several questions. Okay, what your goals are? Are you going to concentrate in a certain area? Because maybe you need this kind of device or this one is some more optimal for you. So it depends on what are you aiming to. You see, or if you're going to be proud, uh, I don't know, how's your budget? Can you afford these kind of devices which are really good? Or this one which works very well or really affordable? So it depends uh, on the specific need of the practitioner. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, uh, uh, one more question is about doing the impossible, because our podcast, it's called Neuro Career is Doing the Impossible. So when something looks like an impossible goal, um, uh, what would be your recommendation of making the impossible possible? Uh, this might be, you know, a neurofeedback practice. This might be working with a certain patient with a certain diagnosis. So maybe it's something that you have experience with and maybe thought as impossible that you've made possible. Well, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, make a kid talking, which is uh, suffer from autism or even the stutter or the, the case that we mentioned before uh, with a stroke and uh, make them help them move again and talk and walk. That, that's amazing. But I believe that one of the, the impossible one thing that I'm thinking of is convince the people to try your feedback to see how it helps 
to improve their life for the best. And uh, what would be your recommendation? How to convince them? Uh, what is that is stopping people from trying neurofeedback? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind, I, I believe, is lack of information. They don't have the information that this technology exists. So it's upon all of us and think that podcasts like yours that are spreading the word that this technology exists. That's the first one. And then for them to take the challenge, because if you ask me 20 years ago, hey, sit down here, I'm going to mess up with your brain. I say, no way, Jose. <laughs> but now you say, you know what? You can trust. There's a lot of experience. The technology was created back in the 60s. We have almost 60 years doing this. So it's safe, it's secure. You can count, you can trust it in the professional that are handling that. And just try it and see how your life or your family lives will change for the best. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, if we will look into the future, how do you foresee of neurofeedback to develop? Uh, what uh, do you anticipate as the next steps in neurofeedback development? And um, uh, what possible changes can you anticipate? Um, maybe new uh, ways of doing it, maybe a new diagnosis or new applications uh, that we will will be targeting as uh, we are moving into the future? Yes, I, I mean, a lot of things going to happen. First of all, you you, you interview Anna. She's a partner and co-founder with PicPod. Um, we're developing the device, the portable and wearable device doing your feedback for kids with ATHC and autism. And I believe that's the future. Everything is going to be wearable, portable, easy to use, affordable. And, and not only that, you know, that because of including the AI, uh, we will understand much better, easier and faster how the brain really works. From my point of view, the brain is just another algorithm. We have just to crack up the code. Um, and we're very close to do it, by the way. Um, also, we have to invite the people to understand that it's going to be almost mandatory to train your brain from now on out. Because the advance of technology and information is so fast. Our brains right now are not designed to keep up with that speed. So we need a special training to keep up with the demand. So the best way to do it is do it with brain training, with doing your feedback. So if you ask me, in the near future, next five years, almost everyone need, will need to train their brains. I think you really touched upon a very important topic because there is a lot of discussion on how can we still keep our advantage of being humans and being better than AI in many ways? How to keep up with all this information that uh, is increasing and increasing in our world? So from what you just told me, it looks like neurofeedback can actually help us uh, with this. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? How can we keep that advantage or uh, how can we uh, process information on a different level that we're processing it now? Yeah, I, I hope you have seen uh, different imaging uh, techniques like SPECTS, which is a single proton uh, tomography, computerized tomography, or fMRI, all those techniques that shows the brain like in functioning in real time. And when you see the different activations, you can see that the brain is not all uh, active at the same time. It depends on what it's doing, it to be here or there or there. But eventually, if you train the brain in certain areas, I believe that brain will light up almost everything. So basically what I'm saying, we're using like a little percentage of what the brain is capable to do right now. We can push it push the boundaries and increase the capabilities of the brain, the natural capabilities. So let's say if you train the, the central part, the reading comprehension, 
processing memories, uh, abstract thinking, all that stuff, you can get better and better and better and better because you're creating more synapses. Maybe, I, I don't know, I'm just saying a number. Right now, for you to read in that part, because the reading is a very complex thing, it's a different part of the brain, but in that specific part, uh, let's say you need 15 connections, 15 synapses, which is nothing because there are trillions, no? But with the training, instead of have 15, you can have 30 or 60 or 100. So imagine the, how you're going to process and perform after those training. And that's just one example. You can do everything much, much better. Thank you very much. And uh, you already mentioned that not all people know about neurofeedback. And uh, some people even know, but they're still on a fence, uh, kind of they're not sure if they sh should choose it or not. Of course, uh, now after uh, you spoke, I think the advantages are very clear. Yes, if I would be listening this for the first time, I definitely would go and try it out. Uh, but maybe there are some misconceptions that you all are already aware of that exist among people about neurofeedback that prevents them from going and trying? I believe that uh, stories plays a good role in this type uh, of questions. Huh? I remember back in Miami when I used to work there, one of the most famous doctors uh, well, I'm not going to mention his neck. Nowadays, he's a friend. I consider him a friend. Um, he works to the Miami Children's Hospital. And he was the lead medical doctor in the for the children and neurologists. Um, when he talked to his patient that they were doing, for example, neurofeedback with me, he said, oh, he's a charlatan, don't pay attention, that, that doesn't work, blah, blah, blah. And then few months later, he started seeing changes on those same kids because they're their patient and were my clients. And I said, hmm, this is strange. And he started like noticing the change, the positive outcome. And then one day he decided to call me and say, hey, Juan, let's talk about this. And I explained a little bit about that. And then to make a long story short, he become one of the, my best referral source <laughs> of all the cases that he see because he started believing. And not only that, his daughter started doing their feedback uh, uh, in her own clinic and they're, now they're become a believers. <laughs> That's the best way I, I have to uh, to show the, how it works. Yes, of course, seeing is believing. Um, uh, what about to those people who are listening and they've heard stories that neurofeedback, you know, it's done by charlatans so or this is not serious. What would you have to answer? Uh, what is the best way to uh, let people know that actually this is not true, uh, that it is a technology that is definitely worth working with? No, just to look look up now that we have this technology that we can ask ChatGPT or even Google uh, to or Gemini <laughs> uh, about this. It gets a little bit more informed, but also the practitioner in the beginning is very important to know that person that has the knowledge, the skills, the experience. And, uh, you know, if it's something new, uh, someone new, you're just learning, okay, you can give it a chance. But if you're doubting, go with a professional with a, uh, with experience. And that almost guarantees you that everything's going to be fine. But then after that, you can go anywhere. Yeah. Thank you very much, Juan. And um, we are nearing the end of our podcast. Um, I asked many questions. You provided many answers. But maybe there is some questions that you would want me to ask you. What would be that question? Wow, that's a difficult one. I, I'm not quite sure because we, I, I believe we have covered a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> we did, yeah. we did. I thought it's a good question. Uh, I Actually, I was asked it at a, at a job interview and I thought, oh, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> so, <laughs> it is, it is, but it makes me think to say, oh. <laughs> no, but maybe um, it's more related to uh, like the scientific part of the neurofeedback part that is, is very rewarding 
in the sense that you can somehow prove that the technique really works. So even though I don't like the scientific world, to be honest, I don't like make the studies and the thing but for me is ooh, the statistic things. I'm not good with number. I'm good with brain, not with numbers. <laughs> uh, but even though, because I felt the need back uh, 10 years ago that I need to publish my own papers, I say, you know what? I I look for I look up for uh, friends and colleagues, even uh, in different countries, that they specialize in the kind of study. Say, okay, I can share my data that I have because I keep all the data, um, and let's publish it uh, as a study. So I I did the whole homework with them. It took us like a year to make it happen, but then. And uh, we already published three different articles by now. So, and that's really important because it not only help us uh, to be taken more seriously, but also help people to really trust in the process. We can say, okay, here are the all the notes and the numbers that show that this really works. Yes. So, and it goes back to that question um, about uh, neurofeedback done by charlatans and whatnot. Uh, here we have a clear scientific evidence that things work and you already cannot uh, say anything against the evidence that is provided and published. Yes. But if I may add, Milena. Yes, of course. Yes, this is really important and it's kind of funny. Even the charlatans can make a good work. <laughs> because in the FIFA works, that does, it really doesn't matter who, who does it. <laughs> yeah, it's so powerful. It, it will work. <laughs> It will work in, in any hands, basically. <laughs> very good. Very good. Okay. So as we're ending our podcast, is there anything else you would like to share with our listeners? Some, some advice, uh, um, anything you want to say? Well, uh, I want to share that I have a new friend called Milena. <laughs> that she is very lovely. She invited me to and uh, spend 90 minutes with her, having real fun. And it's a very interesting podcast. And I strongly recommend to everyone <laughs> to watch your podcast. Thank you so much, Juan. It was a great pleasure talking to you. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I wish all the best to your practice. And I really invite all people who are listening to try neurofeedback. And uh, um, I think um, uh, you, uh, people will see amazing results after it. So uh, thank you very much. Dear Neuro Careers podcast listeners, thank you for joining us on this incredible journey into the entrepreneurial world of neuroscience and neurotechnologies. I hope you've been inspired by the stories of those who are turning groundbreaking ideas into impactful realities. If you are looking for more guidance on succeeding in neuro careers, book a free consultation with me, your podcast host, Dr. K, at the Institute of Neuro Approaches. So, what are you waiting for? Let's navigate the path to success in the world of neuro careers and make the impossible possible together. <laughs>